on a hybrid format. Uh, it gives us great pleasure to welcome Professor Harun Or Rashid, uh, who was until recently the Vice Chancellor of the National University of Bangladesh, has been with the University of Dhaka Political Science Department for many, many years. A uh, person who has published not only in Bangladesh, but also in India, uh, as well as in international journals such as Contemporary South Asia, published from abroad. Uh, you may have already seen his curriculum vitae, uh, but I think what is most important about Professor Harun Rashid is that he is a political scientist with a historical bent who is deeply interested in the process of state formation in Bangladesh. So this is a very, very important area of his research. Now, just to go into the formalities of his curriculum vitae, uh, he obtained his PhD from the University of London in 1983, uh, postdoctoral research in various universities abroad. Professor Rashid is the inaugural Bongo Bondhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman Professorial Fellow at the South Asia Institute in Heidelberg University. I am glad to report also the fact that my colleague, Professor Hans Harder, who was a live wire behind making this professorial fellowship active, is alive, is present with us for this lecture. Uh, we now therefore have professorial fellowships coming from Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. Uh, as a vice chancellor of the National University of Bangladesh, the name of which many of you may not have heard, he was coordinating the activities of numerous colleges which are coming together under that rubric. It is a university that has a fair amount of postgraduate education as well. So he combines sort of transition as a leading scholar in Dhaka University to a kind of a person who tried to make uh, things come together in the newly formed National University of Bangladesh. Now today's lecture is a very important one. It is on the question of whether the partition of 1947 was inevitable. Now this, as you can very well realize, is a fairly thought-provoking and almost provocative proposition. And therefore, I would not like to stand between you and the provocation. Professor Harun Rashi, please. Very good afternoon to everybody. Thank you, Professor Rahul Mukherjee, Rahul Da, for introducing me. Uh, today, I shall be talking about 1947, India's partition. And Professor Rahul Mukherjee has already pointed out that uh, it is very provocative uh, topic and the topic is whether the 1947 India's partition was inevitable or it could have been avoided. India, as we all know, a, a land of great in ancient civilization being inhabited by diverse groups of ethnic, linguistic, religious, and regional communities for centuries together. 
But unfortunately, in the wake of British withdrawal from India, I mean, in the process of decolonization, India, this great land came to be partitioned at the time into India and Pakistan. And that was a most tragic and traumatic event in human history in terms of death and dislocation, as we know. But nowadays, we raise the question, we ask to ourselves whether the partition has resolved what it was intended to resolve at the time. That question is looming large and uh, that question is around us. It, it, still after more than seven decades. Well, this great partition of India, as I am sure many of you know that A.B. Hudson calls it a great divide. It was indeed a great, and as I have already mentioned, a tragic uh, event or division in human history. Now, before I go further, I will rather draw your kind attention to some demographic features of India. That is, uh, yes, if you look at the slide, you will see that Muslims, they constituted 24% of the total population. And, and, and the rest, non-Muslims or Hindus, that is 76%. In some Indian, then Indian provinces, somewhere Muslims constituted three to for 7%, 14%, they are known as Muslim minority provinces. But on a striking feature is, and that is very important, that the Muslim constituted majority in two regions, in Northwest, that is present Pakistan, and Northeast, I mean, present Bangladesh. So, and that, uh, you can see this is the northwest and this is north east. In two regions, the Muslim constituted majority. And that also at the same time constituted a potential threat or challenge to India's territorial integrity. And I will come to this point later that the Congress leadership utterly failed to see the demographic landscape of the Indian India in Popa perspective. And that was a bl bl blunder on the part of Congress High Command, I must say, right? Then, well, uh, again in Bengal, the Muslim constituted 52% of the population and non-Muslim or Hindus, they constituted 48%, meaning almost even. There was hardly any prospect of overriding one community by the other, almost even, right? And given this proportion of demographic, uh, I mean, landscape, Bengal should not have been partitioned in 1947. But at the time, there was a fear. Fear factor is very important in respect of India, India's partition in 1947, as well as in respect of Bengal partition in 1947. This Bengal, I mean, and Punjab, the two big or great provinces came to be partitioned. And Indian partition based essentially on fear factor. I, I'll come to this point later. And so was Bengal partition, you know, fear factor was there. But that, that was not, uh, uh, I mean, well-grounded because two communities are almost even. So there should not have been any kind of fear that the Muslim would, would continue to dominate or rule over the non-Muslims or Hindu community, right? Next. It moves very fast. Okay. Next slide is 
actors of partition. As you know, in politics, there are actors who act, who play the game. So who are the actors of partition? And how, what role did they play? Now, you see the actors of partition, Mahatma Gandhi, all through, he stood for united, undivided India, Akhanda Bharat. That is why his portrait is on the top. And from left, uh, I mean, Lord Mountbatten, at that time, he was the, yes, Lord Mountbatten, he was the Governor General Viceroy of India, right? Who presided over partition of India. Then next, Imagina, as you know, the President of Muslim League. Then Pandit Nehru and Balai Bhai Patel. Only two Congress leaders are here. And there was a meeting of seven leaders. I will come to that point later at the end of my uh, uh, talk. Well, they were the actors of partition. As a matter of fact, they decided the partition of 1947 in Delhi on 22nd June 1947. There was a meeting called Big Leaders Meeting. Seven leaders attended, you know. Then, next slide. Well, as we are talking that uh, what are the roles of the actors? What role did they play? And which ultimately resulted in 1947 partition. First, uh, I mean the British colonial rulers. They should, they should and they must come first. And what they did in the year 1793, they introduced a land system called permanent settlement through which a class of zamindars, a class of zamindar was created in Bengal. They became the owner of land and they are known as zamindars. And some of them turn into money lenders, lending money in terms of profit. And so zamindars and money lenders, they used to be called or known as Mahajans. Incidentally, bulk of Jaminders and Mahajans, they happen to be Hindus by faith. Vis-a-vis the Ishak Proja, meaning peasants, those who are at the bottom of the society, downtrodden people who cultivated land, that is peasants, by and large, the majority of them, they happen to be Muslims. So the economic division through permanent settlement that coincided with religious, I mean, denomination or, or religious division too, that coincided. So though it was, the division was along economic lines, that is a group of people, Jaminders and Mahajan, this a big. Sorry, no. So it is some kind of economic division in the society. But that yes. in points I guess, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, with their communal uh, the, the division two. This is one very significant factor to understand the growth and uh, exceptionally popularity of Muslim League in Bengal, of all the Indian provinces. Why Muslim League was so popular, so strong in Bengal? I mean, the landlord system introduced by the British in the year 1793, that would explain. And I must uh, 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 share my feeling with you at this stage that of all the Indian provinces, the Muslim League and Pakistan movement was very, very strong in Bengal, not in other provinces. Why? It was not on because of their religious consideration. It was essentially based on social, economic, and political, uh, I mean, issues. They, the Bengali Muslims, they wanted to get rid of the exploitation by the Hindu Jominers and Mahajans. So they extended their support to the Muslim leagues in the hope that they will have their emancipation. But as a matter of fact, ultimately, they did not have that emancipation. So 
new phase of struggle of the Bengali Muslims started following the creation of Pakistan in 1947, which uh, I, I will resulted in the War of Liberation in 1971. That is another episode. Next, after the introduction of permanent settlement or Jamindari system, then what did the British do? 1905 Bengal partition. The people did not ask for partition. It is they who did it. And how, they, how did they do it? Along again, communal line. East Bengal, majority Muslim, West Bengal, now inside India, majority Hindus. So the line that they drawn, that was again along communal line. Then, under the British rule, there was one event development of the British rule for, uh, for so many reasons. I hope you are familiar with it, that they did not cooperate with the British initially, and it was Sir Saddam of Khan who tried to pursue them that they should go for uh, English education, etc., etc. That is why when Congress was founded in the year 1885, Muslim was founded after 21 years because Muslims were backward. Bengali Muslims were backward in all respects. Only in one count they were advanced, that was in terms of population. 52%. Otherwise, they were they got in all respects. Then it was not just introduction of permanent settlement and partition of Bengal. What happened next? When the the anti partition Sorry, is, I can't hear you. If I take my earphones out, it disconnects me from Zoom. Uh, uh, 1905 to 1911. In the year 1909. As you can see, the British, they introduced a system, electoral system called separate electorate with reservation of seats for the Muslims. Separate electorate with reservation of seats for the Muslims, meaning by law, you are separating the two communities, legal separation. And this is critically important because the Muslim, they did not, they did not need to seek vote uh, from the Hindu voters, because Muslim voters will elect only the Muslim candidate uh, MPs or members, Hindu voters will elect the, the Hindu voters. So by law, you effected some kind of separation between the two communities. Politics integrates, but here, uh, by passing this law, you rather make a permanent division between the two communities, right? The process of integration, that was not allowed to work. Then patronage to Muslim League and Jinnah. Jinnah apparently he was against the British. And uh, initially he was, definitely he was against the British and for Indian independence. But gradually, I mean, situation developed in such a way that the British had to extend their support and pattern is to Muslim League and Jinnah. When they did it during World War II, when in the year 1939 to 45, World War II was there, India was declared in war, and Congress made, registered a protest. Because at that time, Congress governments were in seven provinces. They registered protest that without consulting them, the, the governor general and vice had declared India in war. So at that time, Fadul Haq, who was the chief minister of Bengal, uh, he was not going in good terms with Jinnah because of Jinnah's increased interference into the internal affairs of provinces. I mean, with the ascendancy of Zinnia's leadership, he was consolidating his leadership step by step, gradually. He was very calculating, and he was very much organization-minded. But Fadul Haq, who was a great leader of Bengal, and he was never in good terms with Muslim League with, uh, and with Jinnah. But following the election of 1937, 
Fazulak and had to join a coalition ministry with Muslim League. But that was not his first priority. His first priority or choice was Congress. I'll come to that point later. So, World War II, the Congress launched a movement that is Quit India movement. Co Congress launched. And Tinna came out with his statement that, well, divide and quit. First you divide, then quit. You cannot quit without, without dividing India. That, that was the stand of Mr. Jinnah. Then, so all, we, 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 all of we know that the British pursued a kind of policy, what we call, or widely known as divide and rule policy. They divided the Indian community, essentially the Hindus and the Muslim community, and in order to prolong and continue their colonial rule. And partition of Bengal, introduction of severity electorate, all are part of their debate and rule policy. And I should also say that the withdrawal of the British, like the American withdrawal from Afghanistan this time, was in a haste because the declared policy of Atli, the Prime Minister of, uh, of uh, UK, that they would withdraw from India by June to uh, 1948. But as a matter of fact, they would do in August 1947, almost about a year ahead. So the, the last decade of British colonial rule from 1937 to 1947 is critical. Was critically important to understand uh, the subsequent political development. Right, British withdrawal and partition of India, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This phase is very important, and and the uh, growth of some kind of, uh, I mean, severity jump between the Hindus and the Muslims. It was not just the Muslims. Uh, 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 I mean, uh, there grew a sense of severity jump among the Muslims. No, it was also equally true among the Hindus of Bengal. They also developed some kind of civilization, you know, or civilization path of po politics. And why it was so, uh, we, we shall come to that point later. Next, Muslim League or Jinnah and other actors. Muslim League slash Jinnah, as a matter of fact, Jinnah said, I created Pakistan with the help of a type leader, meaning other leaders were irrelevant. As a matter of fact, he was the leader, right? And he was, in a sense, omnipotent. So then Muslim League, what was the position of Muslim League? Muslim League stood for separate electorate with reservation of seats. One. Next, on third representation in the central legislature. All in, at the all India level, there will be legislature, parliament, and on third representation of the Muslims. Though the Muslim constituted one fourth in the total population, meaning 24%, meaning one fourth, but Zinnia's claim was one third, right? And no legislation on any special or sensitive matters without the consent of that community, their representative. And how many? Three fourths. I mean, huge majority. That, that was also his point and you know we will see in the next slide that all these were accepted by the Congress. When in the year 1916 when there was Lucknow Pact in the year 1916 Congress accepted Zinnia's claim right but uh, how to explain it that it is a tragedy of history that after 12 years in the year 1928 in the Nehru report they withdrew their acceptance of all these provisions. Nehru report they withdrew and they said well you can have only one fourth not on third representation. Zinnia's claim was on third. Nehru report said only one fourth and no severity electorate because that is detrimental to the growth of unified, integrated nationalism. 
that we understand theoretically it is okay but by taking that position could you halt or stop the partition of india no so the congress leadership should have been more uh, i mean careful accommodative and far sighted okay then in the year 1937 elections took place in 11 provinces in the then india in the year 1937 with extended franchise that was a very meaningful elections you know and the seats in the provincial legislatures are also increased you know especially in bengal before 37 the muslim had only 39 seats but up under 1935 act and following the attack then the seats muslim seats were raised to 121 meaning th- from 39 there was a quantum jump 121 you know because muslim constituted majority and that 129 seats were uh, allowed by the uh, by the british after the three round round table conference then there was uh, 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 i mean mcdonald's award that is communal award under communal award they received that elections were held in the year 1937 and what happened in uh, i mean th- there was congress ministries in seven okay. provinces out of 11 okay. there was congress in india congress ministries were there in seven provinces so congress ministry had developed some kind of yeah among the indian community that develops a kind of dual or the action of indian community under perpetual domination of the hindu community right that kind of fear was in their mind okay this fear factor uh, 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 i mentioned earlier that uh, it was uh, very much uh, in shaping the indian politics then in the year 1940 zinna came out with a new uh, i mean resolution at the lahor session of the all india muslim league that is uh, widely known as the 1940 lahor resolution this is also known as pakistan resolution but uh, i would like to uh, draw your attention to the point that there was nothing called pakistan the word was not in the resolution it was not there subsequently it came to be known as pakistan resolution other as a matter of fact on paper it was lahore resolution right and zinna also came out with this so called two nation theory two nation theory it has no scientific basis in my view it was a framework of united movement of indian muslims who were internally diverse bengali muslims were all together different from non bengali muslims so how to unite them then he came out with a theory just to differentiate the muslims from the hindus that's the so called two nation theory and two nation theory was nothing but a framework of united movement of the indian muslims and the emergence of bangladesh further negated the two nation theory and the nehim sel came out uh, with a statement on 11 august 1947 before immediately before official transfer of power to pakistan he came out the two days from today hindus would cease to be hindus muslim would cease to be muslims all will, will be known as pakistanis a modern man a modern outlook and if we look at jinnah we had a look does he look like a leader of a muslim community and and a movement based on religion so in my understanding pakistan movement was not a religious movement it was out and out a political movement this is my thesis and i stand by right but religion was used who does not use religion narendra modi of india using taking shelter of religion at the time of election right and even 
knowledge is time they use religion even in bangladesh well people are very secular secular government is there but at the time of election they use religion you know in politics to mobilize the people right so it is not something new at that time it was profusely used no doubt about it and but it was a political struggle political fight and a struggle for political accommodation the leadership failed to accommodate the uh, uh, other uh, other parties or, or community that was the main pro problem of the then india you know then this is very important zinnia's acceptance of both long term short term cabinet uh, mission plan 1946 as we know the british showed the seat of separation the british colonial power but at the time of it would dwell they took just opposite stand that they want their preference was to live india united united and undivided that's why they came out with a new uh, plan that is known as cabinet mission plan of 1946 this is very very important you know because if you look at the map then you can see b that is present pakistan at that time there are three provinces sind pandab and north of frontier province this is muslim majority areas right so this will these three provinces will constitute one group called b then here c assam and bengal muslim majority this will constitute another group called c and the rest of india will, will be a that is group a three groups and three tier system it is called at the all india level a loose federal government then in the regional level regional government then provincial government province provincial government regional government then at the all india level there will be uh, i mean uh, federal government and there are the provision for reviewing this arrangement up and after every 10 years after 10 years then the any groups uh, could have asked for reviewing this kind of arrangement right and there was also a, a provision that in a province if a province wish but wanted they could work out from the group then assam was in the c group after 10 years assam might not belong to that c group assam could have opted for joining indian uh, a group a right that provision was also there so some kind of loose federal or confederal system united india india will remain united there will be three groups and province at the provincial level there will be provincial government then at the group level group government then all india government and three will, uh, i mean major functions uh, would be vested in the federal government that is foreign relations currency and defense all others to the regional and provincial government right and residuary powers will be also transferred to the provincial government this kind of arrangement that was known as cabinet mission plan and in my book the foreshadowing of bangladesh in this book and uh, in my other writings i made it very clear that that was the ideal solution of india's political problem that was the ideal solution and interestingly zinna accepted this plan it has two parts long term and short term short term meaning there will be an interim government at the all india level in com, including representative from congress and muslim league and also sikhs this is short term interim government and long term that is constitutional arrangement right and zinna accepted both short term and long term plan that is why aisha zalal in her book the sole exports man zinna and the demand for partition he she has developed a thesis her thesis is based on this contention that pakistan was not zinnia's last word 
If so, then why should we accept cabinet mission plan? That was something short of partition. It was some kind of arrangement within the framework of united India, right? That is her thesis that Pakistan was not her last or final word. It was a bargaining counter. That, 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 that is the argument she, she has developed. Anyway, but what happened? Zindia accepted both long-term and short-term plan. Now let us go to the next slide. Congress High Command Policy Dilemma. Congress High Command, what did they do? What was the official goal of Congress essentially led by Mahatma Gandhi? Akhanda Bharat, United India, right? Undivided India. Mahatma Gandhi came out with this statement that there will be partition over my dead body, right? And incidentally, he was not present at the time when six, seven big leaders decided the fate of India in 1947. He was not there. And you see, goal, Bharat or undivided India. If that is my long-term goal, as an actor, as a player, should not I, I mean, phrase or frame my policy in that way, that, that I may sacrifice, I may sacrifice to some extent my short-term goal, short-term position, but I must have my target at my long-term goal, right? And what was the long-term goal of uh, Congress? Akhanda Bharat, undivided India. But I will show that there was a mismatch between long-term goal and short-term strategy. What was that? Just you see, Congress accepted Lucknow Pact of 1916, as I mentioned, Severity electorate, reservation of seats, on third. Then after 12 years, they came out with new proposal, Nehru report. You can see Nehru report here. And under this report, they, they moved away from Lucknow Pact. No more reservation of seats. No on third, only on fourth. They offered only on fourth. Should India be debated on the issue, very trivial issue, whether you will get on third or on fourth. If I am for United India, I would sacrifice much more, but my main target is United India, right? And I can sacrifice a lot of things to achieve that goal. But the debate center around whether on fourth or on third, just you see. Then uh, in Bengal, Deshabandhu Chittarandhan Das, Siyar Das. He was a great leader, almost Mahatma Gandhi's stature. And he was out of, out, out non-communal, accept, acceptable to both Hindu and Muslim community. He signed a pact in the year 2000, 1923, known as Bengal Pact. And some kind of, I mean, solution based on Bengal, I mean, at the provincial level, signed a Bengal pact, and he founded a party called Sharajyo party, meaning self-rule party. That was founded in the year 1922. And his party was intercommunal, both Hindus and Muslims combined. It was not just like Muslim League, no, or, or simply Congress. Congress was, Officially, it was secular, non-communal, but Muslim did not uh, join Congress that much in terms of number. But see the Sarajya party, if there are four posts, two Hindus, two Muslims, right? So the, there was election in the year two, 1923. In that election, see the Sarajya party won majority in Muslim seats. Though elections were held on the basis of severity electorate, yet he fielded candidates in Muslim seats on the, from Sharajya party and Sharajis, they own majority seats in Muslim seats. Why? Because Siyadas offered a fair deal, a better deal to the Muslim community. And if the Muslim of Bengal 
would have been led by religious consideration or communal consideration, then they should not have voted Sharajya party instead of other Muslim groups or party, right? They did it because as I mentioned that, well, permanent settlement had done a permanent damage, especially to the unity of Hindu and Muslims in Bengal, you know. Then, but that, uh, they, then after the Bengal Pact, there are the election in Calcutta corporations in the year 1924. And in that elections, again, Sharajya party, they secured 10 Muslim seats out of 15. Out of one five, 10 Sharajya party, just you see. So he commanded confidence, both from Hindus and Muslims, Siyadars. And after the election, Siyadars became the, I mean, uh, Mayor of Kolkata Corporation, Mayor, you know, and who was the deputy mayor? Hoshan Shui Sarwardi, who later became the one of the architect of Pakistan movement. He was deputy mayor under Siyadars, and Nitaji Shubhar Chandra Bose was the chief executive officer. Just to see the com combination, Siyadars, Hoshan Shui Sarwardi, Nitaji Shubhar Chandra Bose. Who could divide Bengal if they remain united? But again, it's a, I mean, tragedy of history that Siyadars passed away only at the age of 55 in the year 1925. 1925, when he was only 55 years old, he passed away. And there was hardly any leader of his stature who could combine both communities in Bengal and India, you know. And, well, Congress, but Congress did not approve Bengal Pact of Siyadas. Congress, what was the position of Congress? That it is all India matter. Hindu-Muslim issue is all India agenda. So you cannot resolve at the provincial level. Meaning, the provinces, they were losing their right to resolve their problems on their own meaning some process of Indianization of politics, Indianization of politics, right? And that, that happened. Again, Congress did not approve Bengal Pact, right? Next, immediately after 1937 elections, Hodulak preferred to form a coalition government with Congress. He first made the offer to Congress, they let us come and form a coalition government. Congress did not respond positively at that time. And Dinya thought that, well, there is, there is a golden opportunity and he extended his helping hand to Fadul Haq and said, well, Fadul Haq, you will be the chief minister and my people will support you. And, uh, and he formed a coalition government, Fuzulak formed a coalition government with Muslim League, though he could not survive or sustain in Muslim League for many years, only three years. Then he left Muslim League and, and formed a new government, but that government continued only 16 months, meaning one year and, uh, and four, four months. That was known as Hawk Shema Ministry. Shema Prashad Bukharji, who was the acting president of Hindu Mahasabha, a communalist organization. Fadul Haq made a coalition with Chama Prasad and others. And the forward block Congress and the elder brother of Shubhar Chandra Bose, that is, Sharad Bose was supposed to be the home minister of that ministry. Only before taking oath, two days ahead of that, Sharad Bose was arrested by the British. And the British government did not extend any support to Fadul Haq. Rather, they extended support to the and patronage to Jinnya because of, of World War II, World War situation. And Subhar Bhush, he, he left India and organized other things, all this, because of the given situation, they did it, you know. Even Fadul Haq wrote a letter to Segundar Hayat Khan of Punjab, the chief minister. You cooperate with me. 
and I will put an end to, I quote, Hitlerism of Jinnah. Hitlerism of Jinnah, I will put an end. You please cooperate with me. But he did not come up. He also approached the governor of Bengal, Anderson, John Hubbard, but uh, he did not get any support. Finally, Fuzulak re rejoined and formed a new ministry. And he wrote a very fiery letter to, to, to the British uh, crown. That letter is in the archives that uh, what happened, how he was forced by the governor to resign. And after the resignation of Fuzulak's second ministry, that is Shamahawk ministry, can Fuzulak realize that there should be a ministry combining both Hindus and Muslims of Bengal. Otherwise, there would develop some kind of severities, uh, I mean, uh, trend of politics among the Bengali Hindus being very influential uh, in all respects, but they are outside government. So it should not continue uh, uh, for a long time. And situation rather forced him for a while to, to uh, 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 I mean, uh, join Muslim and uh, uh, work with Jinnah, but uh, he was not he was not at all in good terms with Jinnah, because even Fuzulak made an statement that I would not allow anybody from outside to meddle into the internal politics of Bengal. So Fuzulak was out and out a Bengali, you know, and Bengali sentiment was very much there. I am emphasizing this point only for the reason the why Bangladesh. If you want to understand the why Bangladesh, why Pakistan did not sur survive more than 23 years, then these points are very important, you know, because Bengali and non-Bengali tension, conflict, controversy uh, around language long dated back, even before 1947, within Bengali Muslim League and Pakistan movement, the controversies were there. Right? So it was not just a uh, because of common religion, we have Bengali Muslim extended their support to Pakistan. No, not at all. It was essentially because of their economic and political and social consideration. Then, not only for the law, the second election held under the British in the year 1946, right? After the election, Sarawardi came forward and he was supposed to uh, form government. He approached the Congress High Command and Jinnah for a coalition ministry in Bengal with Congress. And finally, he was unsuccessful. Both High Command did not approve it because it was an all India issue or agenda. You see, again, Indianization of politics, right? And Sarwardi formed his government on 24th of April, 1946 keeping some seats vacant in the hope that, well, some kind of solution will be there and uh, that seats will be filled up by the uh, Congress uh, nominees, but that did not take place. So, next, Nehru's conditional acceptance of cabinet mission plan. This is very uh, uh, important and interesting. British position was, you must accept long-term and short-term plans, both, and it must be absolutely unqualified. But I mean, Nehru, at that time, 1946, he succeeded Maulana Abul Kalam Azad as president of Congress. And on the question of cabinet mission plan, what was his position? He came out with a statement, I read, Yes. It is not a question of our accepting any plan, long or short. We are not bound by a single thing, except that we have decided for, thank you, thank you, sir. We have, we have decided for the moment to go to the Communist Union Assembly. You understand? It is not a question of long or long term or short term. Only we have resolved that we will go to the Constituent Assembly. And as I know that you call, you command majority, so what we will do in the uh, in the Constituent Assembly? 
So you have to make um, your commitment beyond outside the uh, constituent assembly that well, we'll abide by or we'll uh, allow you this kind of seats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That he did not do. Only plain statement that we have resolved to go to the constituent assembly and nothing be beyond that. Maulana Abul Kalam Azad in his books, India Wins Freedom, last 30 pages, which came up after 30 years, he has categorically mentioned that it was a blunder on the part of Nehru. Had Abul Kalam been there, he would have not made such, such a de derogatory statement, right? And you see, Zinna accepted cabinet admission plan, meaning sort of Pakistan, uh, partition. Why should not you go for it if Akhando Bharat is your long-term goal? That, but you say only you constitute 24%, so we will have only one foot. So my thesis is there was some kind of mismatch in Congress policy. That is mismatch between long-term goal and short-term strategy. Short-term strategy was majority and rule, guided by majority, by number. A long-term goal was Akhando Bharat. So there was some kind of mismatch, right? Well, and it will be relevant that in Bangladesh, the hill people or indigenous people who constitute less than or around nearly half percent, not even 0.56%, not 1%. But Bangladesh government, concluded a peace accord with them. Why? Because of their concentration in a particular region. They constituted six, uh, I mean, uh, not uh, six lakhs, slightly more than half a million in terms of population, but the government concluded a peace accord with them on equal footing because of their concentration in a particular strategic region in Bengal, that is in Sidagam Hill Tracks, bordering India and Myanmar. And it was densely a forest area, you know, and hilly. So it was an ideal heaven for guerrilla warfare. And that continued for, um, um, uh, for about two decades. Finally, government had to sign. And now Shantul Arma is, is, is the chairman of the regional uh, council. Uh, uh, and his state as his state minister. So there is a solution. But here you say you take only in commensurate with your number that is uh, one fourth, not one third. This, this is totally absurd. Then Meru's next. Sorry. Uh, yeah, we have come to the end, I think. Well, then uh, another five minutes. Okay. Bengal, after Bengal Pact, Sierra said Bengal Pact, I mentioned, cabinet mission plan was the last dish of hope for keeping I India united. But, well, Congress, well, the, the leadership failed to avail it, you know. Congress business, it, I have already mentioned, Congress failed to see the demographic distribution of India. That in two regions, they, 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 there is Muslim concentration. So the, la the demographic landscape, they utterly missed to see the land, demographic landscape of the then India. I mean, Congress leadership. And if, even Zinnia did not play fair, he accepted cabinet vision plan, that is okay. And after 10 years with the, with the departure of the British, things could have been different because there was Ballob by Patel, who was an Iron Man. And uh, he, he made a lot of contribution consolidating in India, you know. So in the absence of the British, things could have been different because in, in independent India, we, what we see, Prime Minister is Hindu and so many Muslim president, right? Zakir Hussain and uh, uh, a visit Abul Kalam and uh, some other Fakruddin Ahmed. 
you know, this is accommodation. So what you can do after partition, why should not you think in terms of doing this kind of thing before 1947? Next, fear factor. Zinnia's hasty withdrawal of cabinet vision plan and his declaration of direct action day. The well, Congress did not accept unconditionally, so I withdrew my acceptance of cabinet vision plan and I declared direct action day to visit Pakistan. And that day was on 16th of August, 1946, when the great Calcutta killing took place. There was a great riot, more about 10,000 people sacrificed their lives. And in a sense, Pakistan was created on the blood of the Bengalis, you know. But incidentally, or unfortunately, even Zinnia did not visit the riot victims uh, immediately after the, this, because uh, he was, uh, uh, he was uh, handling uh, even sitting in, in Delhi, all these things. Fear factor is important. Fear factor in the mind of the Muslims. In United India, there will be minority, perpetually minority. In Bengal, we Bengalis, Hindu and Muslims, we are proud of our language, literature, common history, everything. We are indivisible. We force the British to undo the partition of Bengal. But in the year 1947, at the time of the withdrawal of the British, the Bengali Hindus or Badalok or caste Hindus, they opted for partition of Bengal. There was a move for United Independent Bengal. That is another episode initiated by Sarwardi, who was the Chief Minister, Sarat Chandra Bhush, Kiran Shankar Roy, Abul Hashem. They combined together and initiated a move that, well, Bengal should not be divided. It should remain united and it will be the third independent state. Interestingly, British government was agreeable to it. I have gone through the dual volume of transfer of prayers in India official library record. Right, and uh, I saw there was two declaration. If two states, one declaration. If three states, another de declaration. And that was up to 2nd June, 1946. So there was every prospect or possibility of keeping Bengal united and independent. But if, but there was a move initiated first, initiated by Hindu Mahasabha, Sama Prasad Mugardi, then a large section of Bengal Congress also participated. And All India High Command of Congress, particularly Nehru and Patel, they are for Bengal partition. If Pakistan, Bengal has got to be partitioned. That was the position. And they decided the fate of Bengal. At least Baldev Singh of Punjab was there, representing the Sikh community, but there was none from Bengal. Bengal fate was decided at uh, Delhi at the leaders' conference, and there are no representatives there from, from Bengal, not, no question of, not to speak of referendum or, or election, though referendum took place in Silet, but on the question of Bengal partition, no, it did not take place. So fear factor, the last decade, I mean, 40, 37 to 47 is important. And there, during that period, there are three Muslim, Chief Minister, Fadulak twice, then Najibuddin, then Sarwardi. And Bengali Hindus who were advanced in all respects in the field of education, business, land, professions, everywhere. They, they are not, they are outside power. And they have developed a sense of separatism among the Bengali Hindu Bodhulo, you know. And finally, fear factor that if Bengal remain united, the Muslim slightly majority, but it will be another version of Pakistan and they will be under the rule of the Muslim. So let Bengal be divided. So again, fear factor in, uh, among, uh, among the Bengali Hindus, fear factor uh, among the uh, uh, Muslims of Pakistan. The fear factor was very important and very vital. Finally, British colonial rulers, as I said before, showed the seeds of partition. Among the actors, they are number one. And my understanding is, had there been no British colonial intervention through the Battle of Palasi, there would have been most likely no partition, right? And it was mainly because of British colonial intervention. Last slide, leaders conference in Delhi, 2nd June 1947, seven leaders, three from Congress, Asarjit Kripalani, then 
Nehru and Patel, three. Mahatma Gandhi was not there. And three from Muslim League, Jina, Legadali Khan, and Abdul Rab Mister. And one from Sikh community, Baldev Singh. These seven, it was called Big Seven. They decided the fate of India, presided over by Lord Mountbatten, representing the British Crown and British government. Finally, my understanding is that there was Bengal Pact, there was a move from Fazul Haq for a coalition, things could have been different. And without the support of the Bengali Muslims, without the involvement of the Bengali Muslims, there would have been no Pakistan. What is, the, what is that map? Last, this is the last slide. I, I would draw your kind attention to this. If you see this, in the year 1937 elections, in Pandra, out of 84 Sikhs, Muslim Sikhs, only two Sikhs secured by Muslim League, only two. In Sindh, no nomination. In North Frontier Province, no nomination. Muslim League was so weak at that time. Only in Bengal, just to see, in 1937, 35 Sikhs, Muslim League secured, out of 117. And in the 1946 elections, Muslim League secured out of 117 territorial seats, 110 plus four, I mean, reserve seats. Altogether, Muslim League secured 119 out of 121. So Bengal was the stronghold of Muslim League and Pakistan movement. But again, I, I will, uh, uh, may I make a, what is called soft reminder that it was not because of religious consideration. They extended their support just to get rid of landlordism the, uh, from the uh, exploitation of the Hindu Jamindar and Mahajans, right? Because Bengalis, they, they are altogether different. Culture, language, history, uh, uh, everything different. Food habit, everything. So Zinnia's two nation theory is also applicable, better applicable in case of Bengali Muslims and non-Bengali Muslims or Bengali Muslims and West Pakistani Muslims. It is more applicable, right? Because we, we don't share anything. Even in terms of religion, we are more, uh, how do you call, uh, what is that? Yeah, Professor Hadar, Subhijam. Subhi, 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 Subhi brand of Islam. That is more accommodative, tolerant, and peaceful coexistence. And Pakistanis, they are more inclined to Wahhabism, militant, right? Puritarian. And they did not think that Bengali Muslims are Muslims, they are half Hindus. And Bengali Muslims are 99.9% .9 converted Muslims. That is their background. That is also important, you know. We share many things. Finally, there are a number of opportunities where they are. But the leadership, they fail to rise up to the occasion and avail those opportunities. That was, that is why India got partition in 1947. So partition was not inevitable, rather it was made inevitable by the then political leadership. This is my conclusion. Finally, before I conclude, but the disintegration of Pakistan within a period of 23 years and the emergence of Bangladesh, it was not unavoidable. It was rather inevitable. It has got to be there because if you look, sorry, if you look at the map, you see this is this is Pakistan, and this was East Pakistan. Not all hundred, hundred thousand, one hundred, thousand, more than thousand miles Indian territory, and it was not only distance. We hold all together everything different. So. It was not essentially because of distance that Pakistan disintegrated. It is because of we hold a distinct national identity. And language movement was not the question, that is the final word. Language movement was not the question of recognizing Bengali as one of the state language of Pakistan. It related very much, intimately related to our Bengali identity. That's why in the year 1952, the, the students of Dhaka University and people, they, they shed their bloods, not, not, not just to protect the right to language, to protect their 
distinct self identity that is why the partition of india was not inevitable and well many from pakistan india bangladesh we regret it has not solved the, the internet issues now there are more muslims in india than pakistan then uh, uh, why is partition and but it was not inevitable it was made in inevitable by the leadership but emergence of bangladesh is it is inevitable if you want to know you and if professor mukherjee and harder organize another uh, seminar like this then i can come out with my thesis why partition of uh, why disintegration of pakistan emergence of bangladesh was inevitable with these words uh, i would like to thank you very much for uh, uh, keeping yourself with me for a long time and it is my great pleasure to talk before you uh, thank you very much i uh, i am uh, really grateful to uh, uh, rahul da the executive director and chair of the department of policy science and also my another mentor professor hans harder and uh, what about him he is still here yes are you saying that he will not be here <laughs> Huh? Uh, yes, sir. Great. Okay, thank you. Now we should move out of the slides. Now we should move out of the slides, and uh, because this is in the hybrid format, uh, Mia, can you just come and pull in a bit? This, we just want to get out of the slides so that we can have the full screen. I can see Professor Indivar Kamtekar. <laughs> we have. a professor of modern history from jnu looking at us at this point in time we have professor kama maclean also now we can we can actually see people so they can raise their hands so i think uh, we've had a, a wonderful treat because uh, i mean many of us know about aisha jalal's work but i think what professor rashid tried to highlight was the fact that from the bengal perspective the partition was not certainly not encouraged and there was very little representation from the bengal side when the partition happened uh, just before we get into q and a i want to uh, just <laughs> uh, share with you an anecdote that was shared with me uh, some earlier this year by uh, india's former vice president mr hamid ansari who uh, narrated uh, the story of a letter that uh, mohammad ali jinnah wrote to prime minister nehru soon after partition saying that you know please keep my house in bombay because after retirement i will come and stay there and this came from no other than a person who was the vice president of india until recent times so with that uh, anecdote the floor is open for question and answers we have about 20 minutes to 25 minutes so please uh, yes professor mitra professor harder abdul wahid in that order mitra, yes professor mitra thank you very much for a wonderful talk and there was a subtext to your lecture was the creation of bangladesh in a level and i have been noting down the excellent arguments Uh, on on that point, but uh, I'll come to that later. Let me first uh, ask a question and then make a compliment. The question is this: Partitions happen all the time in India. After independence, every single political unit was partitioned, and they are done quite nicely. Now, if I were to look at 1947 from Dhaka to today, I would say. Thank God, we are an independent country. So I partitioned. They have taken over Pakistan, and they have been much better than India in human development. So partition is not such a bad thing. If I were to look at it from that point of view, so why do we qualify partition as unfortunate and tragic? Is it the partition itself, or the unintended consequences, as Merton would say? And then, why were those consequences so tragic? That that is the kind of question. 
Here is my um, conjecture. Now look, inevitability is a magical concept. When you look at it from the social sciences, if something is inevitable, what well, what to explain? Because what happens for us is a combination of chance and choice, structure and agency. So it would be nice if we could separate the structural arguments from the agency driven argument. Today I've had a lot of agents, you know, power, short term, and that kind of thing. But where there, where there structural arguments? I think about it because of your own contribution to the development of the Bhasha Andalan. And when I see how Bangla has developed compared to Bengali, US Bengal, I see the nucleus of a structure. And that structure is emerging and pushing agency towards it. So, was Pakistan movement merely a political argument by China? Was the two nation theory merely a metaphor? Or was there something more compelling, something more organic, something uh, much more important than just office mongering? Thank you. Okay. So we just want now. Should we take the no, Professor Hunter? You first want to. I can respond. Sure. Uh, well, uh, Professor uh, Mishra, thank you very much for your questions and observation. Why should I call or we call Pakistan partition unfortunate? Uh, th that is the first question. Why should not we? Because, uh, you know, India was partitioned, but India and Pakistan, they fought three wars, 1948, 65, and 71, right? So partition did not uh, desist these two countries from engaging in wars, in three wars. And well, what are the extent of these locations? and death toll uh, as a follow-up of par partition in 1947. And say, well, Britain is no more in EU, but EU, European Union is there, right? So India, as I say, that a land of plurality, diverse community from linguistic, religious, ethnic point of view, right? So use and land of ancient civilizations. The Muslims, Hindus, and Jains, Sikhs, and other religious faiths, they used to live together for centuries. Even before the advent of the British, there were Muslim rule for 550 years in India and Bengal. And there was no problem. There was kind of, uh, I mean, joint administration if we look at Bengal history, you will come across that the rulers were Muslims, but uh, all key posts are occupied by, by the Hindus. That was during the time of uh, even Nawab Shaldullah and Murshid Ghuli Khan, the uh, independent, uh, I mean, Nawab of Bengal. So some kind of joint administration was there. So, and uh, why should we get uh, divided or uh, why there should have been partition to resolve what other if, if we look in the other way that well if india pakistan bangladesh remain united just to see that a a huge uh, i mean uh, not only mess of land rather uh, we, we, we would have much more prospect well i got your point that there would have been no bangladesh had there been no partition. But again, we must not be mistaken that Bangladesh is there because of Pakistan. No, Bangladesh could have been there without Pakistan. The move was in the year 1947, as I mentioned, right? So, well, but that was aborted. That is why we had to wait for 23 years and fight a war of liberation, and we came out uh, independence. And structural, you, you say the Bengali, in, in Bangladesh formed a nucleus of Bengali identity. That is uh, 
uh, all that, 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 that is true. Uh, about that point I touched upon, in this sense that uh, there, there grew some kind of political separatism among the Hindu Bodhulok or Hindus, caste Hindus in, in Bengal, right? And uh, in the course of history, you know, and again, that was also because of the colonial power. Otherwise, uh, well, we used to live in, in Bangladesh, we used to live together side by side, no problems. Rabindranath Tagore's Amar Shonar Bangla, Amito Mephalawashi, My Golden Bengal, I adore you, I love you, is our national anthem. Nothing wrong in it, right? That kind of Bengali. That is why I say that, uh, and I ponder over, over the question that whether why Bangabandhu Sheikh Pujir Rahman is the greatest Bengali ever born? Because or did his, what was his statement? When I will be taken to the gallop, I will utter one thing that I am Bengali, Bangladesh is my land, Bengali is my language. In the history of Bengal, comprising both Hindus and Muslims, I will, we will not find another second person who will say that just sitting in front of the gallow, I will say that I am a Bengali. He did not say I am a Muslim. He said I am a Bengali, Bengali is my land, and Bengali is my culture, right? So it is true that we are nucleus, it is there. The, the, the river, mighty river, narrowed, but the current, it flows. And the, the Bengali national identities got expression through the uh, uh, I mean, emergence of Bangladesh, right? So, um, uh, well, uh, it happened so in, in, in course of uh, uh, history, in the course of history, but uh, I would rather prefer to see and love to see that the cabinet mission plan would have been the ideal, ideal solution. Three regions, regions, delegation of powers, regional government would enjoy enormous power. Like, a, like now Mamata Benarji is the chief minister of West Bengal and Modi is the prime minister of uh, India. No problem, right? No problem in the sense power sharing. That kind of power sharing could have been there and the leadership should have visualized that, well, allow Mr. Dinna something more than his due and have India, uh, uh, let us get India united and undebated. Later on, we will resolve. As Professor Mukherjee said, the Zinna's letter to Nehru, that, that look after my house, home in Mumbai, in my retired life, I, I, will, I will stay there. But I don't think that, well, oh, uh, Jinnah, though he accepted cabinet mission plan, meaning uh, I've been moved away from his Pakistan demand, but it was mainly a strategic move on the part of Jinnah. If he would have that kind of love and an attachment to the soil of India, then he should not have abruptly withdraw his acceptance of cabinet mission plan. That I, that I have also mentioned, right? So I did not spare the idea, right? I tried to see what role, what actor played, okay? I, I tried to be uh, as much possible, as objective as much possible. Thank you. Thank you for your good questions and uh, of course compliment. Yes, Hans, yours are next. My, my question is already answered. I was asking a question about direct action there. And uh, uh, thank you so much for informing my presentation. I think it's wonderful. Yes, yes. Professor Harder. Direct action day, $60. Okay, so. Okay, 1946. Yeah, could you explain, Professor Ashish? It's been an impressive lecture. Professor Harder. I think you answered your question. Uh, the question you put into the title of your lecture very impressively also. So the 1947 partition was not in the right? This yeah. is what I'm going to take home. Still, I have two, two little questions. And I'm not a historian. I'm not very well versed in these areas I'm, I'm going to ask you about. But still, I have a general understanding that first, 
two points. First point is that if the Hindu Zamindars yeah. were not really put into place by the permanent settlement, they had already been there. That was an heritage from the Mughal period, as far as I can say, where you had a structure with the Nawabs on job residing in Dhaka, later Mushkabad. But the second layer of that feudal hierarchy was made up of a majority of Hindus, even in those day days, even under the Mughals. But the permanent settlement changed, I think, was the mode of possession of the land, right? And the, the way of extracting money from that. Absentee, absentee land Buddhism and all this sort of stuff came in, not perhaps before that. But the Hindus were in place before. This is one thing I think it comes out from, for example, the research of Richard Eaton on, on the on pre-modern uh, Bengal, right? And the other point is about this, uh, the, the seed of uh, uh, unrest being the uh, creation of separate electorates. This, I think, is a very strong point. You made it very strongly that the separate electorates sort of uh, uh, put it into the system, put com communalism into the very setup of things. Now, you blame the British for putting them into place. And I was wondering if not the British in putting them into place certainly did the wrong thing, but didn't they do it under the pressure of the Muslim League already? Wasn't there a pressure for separate electorates from the Muslim League? So is it right to put the whole responsibility for that to the British? Okay, okay. Uh, finished? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you could have spoken in Bangla. Oh. <laughs> As I know, but for the other audience, uh, you, you did the right thing. First, I fully agree with your first questions. And uh, I also know, but uh, you also know that the, those Zominder, they used to collect revenue on behalf of the state or, or the ruler. They are not legally Zominders. They were known as Zominders. They used to collect revenue from the peasants but they are not Zamindars by law. But with the introduction of the permanent settlement, now the, there are the structural change. Change in this sense, they are now the legal owner of land. And they can go for extraction, what they did, and you mentioned. And you know, the peasants, peasants, they could not dig a pond for water, cut trees, build a nice house without the consent of the Zomindars. And what kind of persecutions and exploitations were there, just uh, you will shudder. And uh, uh, there are a lot of books there, right? The, 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 how they were, uh, the peasants were persecuted. That kind of persecution was not during the time of the Muslims when the Hindus are the Zomindars, right? Zomindars, well, that are, they are used to be known as Zomindars because they collected land. You, you are correct in that sense that they are, the Zomindars are there before the introduction of permanent settlement, but different type of Zomindars, you know, right? This is the answer. So there is a, there is a, a, a sea of difference uh, between, uh, between the two. Seeds of separatism, uh, whether there was kind of pressure from Muslim League to introduce separate electorate. Muslim League was, was just, it was a paper organization. It was like a club. How could they exert a pressure? They, don't, they did not have that kind of strength because there was a Muslim delegation headed by uh, Aga Khan. And they sat on the Vice-Royal Lord Mintu. That was in the year 1906, begging or asking for severe electorate. That Muslims, they are backward in all respects. So they will not be able to compete in uh, general constituencies. So please let us have severe electorate with reservation of seats. Who, who, I don't know. It is. It, it may not be unlikely that at the time there was Part anti partition hesitation. So the British might have advised the Muslim leader that you come and uh, and um, uh, and uh, place the agreement. 
uh, the, 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 place this demand. We, we don't know. That, that has yet to be unfolded. But even it was a demand coming from the Muslim, but the Muslim League was very just. It was established in the year 1906 in Dhaka, December. And immediately after, in the, in the year 19, 1906, they uh, made a call on the Viceroy. And the, the uh, uh, I mean, severity lecture was uh, allowed in the year 1909. So it was not just uh, for the uh, pressure coming from the Muslim League or the um, uh, Muslim, they, they, uh, they had to, uh, 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 I mean, uh, introduce severity directorate. It was a part of divide and rule policy and it was a structural separation. So dangerous, you know, permanent settlement is one and had there been no permanent settlement, there would have been no partition in Bengal. Uh, that, that, that I can uh, take, say, uh, taking all the responsibilities, you know, academic responsibility. And again, again, severe electorate, a permanent damage, a structural division, a legal div division uh, uh, between the people because political parties, elections unite. Uh, here you make a legal division between the two streams. You don't need to seek my board. I don't need to seek your board. Then how could we interact and uh, unite? So there is separation, legal separation. And that resulted uh, in 1947 separation, right? Okay, thank you. Okay, now we have a last set of questions. I think Anish and then Philip. Oh, I, I did not uh, respond to one question, I did action there, right? Yeah, it was like a PSA. I, uh, okay, just uh, I uh, may answer very brief or uh, shortly that, well, Gina declared 16 August as direct action day. At the time, Hoshin Shai was the chief minister of Bengal. He declared holiday and there is a lot of controversies and speculations that why should he declare holiday, keeping riot in his mind. And uh, official version is, even if we go through Abu Hashem's war in retrospection, he has also come out with the statement that, well, my, my son, Rodri Di Rumor, he, you know him, Rumor, was at that time nine years old, and I took him uh, on the dais. If, riot, there will be riot, communal violence, that was in our mind, then I, I did, I, I would not have taken my uh, 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 younger son with me in the, on the dais. Cabinet mission plan was absolutely responsible for uh, 16th August, uh, I mean, Great Calcutta Kili. I can explain, I don't have time, but I can just um, uh, share my understanding with you that it was neither the Congress nor the, nor the Muslim or Muslim League. It was the cabinet mission plan. They played the, two, the, the, the feelings and sentiment of the two communities against each other so much so that any tricky event would have flared up and uh, uh, resulted in communal violence. That happened because it was a very sad situation, you know, British will withdraw in the year 1946. Just on, and that was a very, very crucial, crucial, crucial time, you know. And Congress did not accept Cabinet Mission plan. Then they had to withdraw. He declared yes. But in Calcutta, well, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, it took place again in Bengal. Why? Because, because of the extent of involvement of the Bengali Muslims, because they wanted to get rid of, 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 of what I say, the exploitation, from Hindu Jomidar and Mahajans at any cost. And they thought that, well, they will, be, they will have it through, uh, 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 I mean, uh, Pakistan. And understanding of Pakistan, a section of Bengali Muslims had different, altogether different, including Bangabandhu, Shepudhi Raman. They did not think in terms of single united Pakistan. In 1940 Lahore Resolution, there was not no word of Pakistan, not even single state. It, rather stipulated the establishment of two independent states. It is, it, it is written in black and white, categorically, that there will be independent states in the Muslim majority zone. Then meaning one independent state in West Pakistan, present Pakistan, another in Eastern Bengal. Two independent states, right? That was the understanding. 
if you go through bangabandhu's unfinished memoirs then at page 22 he has written that our state would vision was as such that there would be three states on pakistan on bengal and other rest of india he has mentioned it he was involved in pakistan movement but 1947 pakistan was not his state vision that is why he started the language movement the, the, the next day following the creation of pakistan this why should it take even one year two year that the next day why should we start language movement because because pakistan was established with with, with the seeds of bengali distinct identity that has got to be uh, i mean uh, underscored we and are, we are running out then, of time but we'll take okay. a last round of questions there is professor sayed vikar ali shah also from pakistan who yeah. wants to uh indiver do you have a comment to make well i i could if time uh, so, uh, so what, what, what we'll do is we'll take, we'll take the question from professor vikar ali shah and then a comment from professor indiver kamtekar who is professor in jnu and then we will take anish and philip and then some final so, comments and right uh, yes professor uh, vikar ali shah thank you very much professor for providing me this opportunity to listen from someone who is coming from the next end of the then indian empire because you know and and then thank you for giving me this opportunity to hear the voices of mitra da and hans <laughs> whom i am missing since 2 year 3 years so i am coming from another end of the then indian empire north west frontier province and uh, i really enjoyed the talk of uh, professor harun ur rashid but then Uh, something something is very different in my province when you compare it with bengal for example professor more than once mentioned that the the cabinet mission plan and this uh, grouping this was to him the best solution while our destruction our misery started from that day when we were compulsory th- this compulsory grouping and when we were put into group b bacha khan abdul ghafar khan who was earlier than this busy in the in the aftermath of the great calcutta killing because he was in right affected area for 6 months he was away from his province touring the right affected area in bihar and in bengal and uh, in places where uh, non muslim where muslims were not allowed to to enter bacha khan went there where non muslims were not because he was equally accepted to both and you see throughout these uh, uh, march onwards he wrote so many articles he published so much on this particular issue that we should not be in group b and we should not we, we, this is not acceptable to us this compulsory grouping of the cabinet mission plan so it might be good for bengal it might be good for other places but definitely not for the northwest frontier because onwards then you see then came another bombshell this was third june plan and under 3 june plan a referendum in the northwest frontier i mean referendum was held in both sylhet and the northwest frontier but the people we totally rejected the referendum and 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 then they boycotted it so uh, this is just only not a question but observation when you generalize something i mean I, i'm not happy being a student of history with this gross generalization because this compulsory grouping played a havoc with the northwest frontier province thank you very much thank you maybe amra let us take all the questions no given a video here yes professor kamtekar yeah so uh, you know in this talk a lot of the standard issues of uh, partition historiography have been covered and i'll just make a quick set of comments on this uh, was first let us recognize that the view that partition is uh, unfortunate is a very subjective viewpoint it's not the pakistani national viewpoint in any case where the price would have been worth it so in india partition is seen as undesirable and that is a common view but this is uh, i would also say that this is a question which it is impossible to answer in any reasonable way why do you say it is uh, unfortunate because there is mass killing um, with maybe you know 500000 or 1 lakh dead there are wars subsequently fine but the argument which was given at that time for partition was that you will have prolonged civil war in the subcontinent 
This is the Congress rationalization for partition. Now, would that have occurred? Would it, would India have been a large scale Lebanon for many years? Who can actually say? After all, in Bengal famine, you had 3 million dead. You have uh, 500,000 dead. It could be many multiplied many times over India. Nobody could actually, none of us can say that more people would not have died. So, uh, you know, this involves a level of prediction which we simply cannot make. It could have been worse. It may not have been worse. So the answer we cannot really give, except we cannot give a historically definite answer. We can venture an opinion that no, we would have lived happily ever after as one country, but we can't be sure. Second, the cabinet mission plan. Uh, you know, there is, after all, the remarks of Jinnah and the remarks of Nehru are available in the transfer of power volumes. And what they reveal abundantly is that while Nehru spoke probably too much saying that we will not abide by this, so did Jinnah. Jinnah in his speeches says that cabinet mission plan we will accept as a step towards sovereign Pakistan. And uh, what uh, Nehru says is we will accept it as a route to undivided India. So one is, so there is a kind of acceptance, but both sides are prevaricating. One side says that Nehru says that the center will take control over the provinces. Uh, Jinnah says we will weaken the center. So both sides have very different uh, understandings of what the cabinet mission plan is meant to lead to. And that means that as a piece of constitutional jugglery or what a jugglery, it is a vastly overrated document because both sides are intent to sabotage it. Uh, as far as the Congress should have given more, you know, again, we can, it is easy to say this, but remember that there is a real fear of balkanization of the country. There are 500 princely states. So the argument on one side would be that the Congress says we will accept partition over a reduced area. We will accept high control, complete control over a, um, uh, over a reduced area. If there is a coalition government, will there be agreement on how the army is to be used? After all, the army intimidates the princely states into India. That is what underwrites it. So would you have the kind of territorial integrity which, which follows with strong central control? The basic question there is of the, uh, of the strength of the Indian center. And there is a strong reason given, it may be right or it may be wrong, for why there is a, um, there is a reluctance to work the cabinet mission plan. Finally, you know, I'll just say one thing, that there is an irony here. In history, the documents from the 1940s show that nobody knows really what is going to happen. Will there be United India? Will there be balkanization of India? Everybody, will there be this scheme, that scheme? There are hundreds of schemes. Now, the irony of political science, history, and so on, is that things which are unexpected, we in our professions try to discuss whether they are inevitable. Before, nobody knows what's going to happen. Afterwards, we debate whether they are inevitable. So there is something in this uh, way we react professionally to it. Uh, and maybe I will even say cynically that the job of historians is to make the unexpected look like the inevitable. Now, you know, that may be the case with Bangladesh, that it was maybe unexpected. You say that it's inevitable. It may be with Pakistan. The Pakistanis will say that Pakistan is inevitable, two-nation theory and so on. So... Uh, should we really be asking the inevitability question? Because history in itself is so unexpected. I, I leave it there. Good. So we have some very important, interesting comments. Anish Mishra and then Philip Zimish. Uh, please make it short. Yeah, so yeah. I'm very, very, very fast. So I just have two, two quick, quick points to make. So, Professor, the first point is a very uh, contentious um, uh, uh, point that you made in this uh, talk is that your contentious, your contentious point was that you said that um, Jinnah's 11 August 1947 speech, the one you said that you know, Hindu cease to be, Hindu Muslim cease to be. Uh, yeah. So, and, and the emergence of Bangladesh in uh, 1971, you said that this negates the, the two nation theory of Jinnah. So, um, so why I say that this is a contentious, contentious point is that if you look at the, the, at the Lahore resolution of uh, that was passed. It did say that geography, geographically con con uh, contiguous units were, 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 were to join and become independent sovereign uh, Muslim states. So the word states uh, was, was used. So and, and also um, yeah and, and also you know China was you know willing to accept a united framework. 
uh, and, and you know, you say that, that the, this thing between um, that the two nations KV should be more applicable to, to you know East Pakistan and West Pakistan because you have more more um, difference between them. But Gina once told a lot, uh, 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 told that a man is that a man is called Punjabi or Bengali because a Hindu or Muslim. So, so in, in, in many ways, I don't see how the emergence of, of Bangladesh actually negates the two nations. Maybe after all, you should ask, what is the, the raison d'etre of Bangladesh? I mean, why, why East Bengal did not become an Indian province in uh, 1971? Uh, so, you know, Bangladesh first, you know, the, uh, and Mujibur Rahman himself was a supporter of the Muslim League, you know, in, in the days of the Pakistan movement, he supported the Pakistan movement. And then you are saying that he's going to the gallows and say that I'm first Bengali. So it means that in 47 he said, I'm Muslim, give me Pakistan. And then in 71 he realized what the Bengali. So he took 23 years, or he took, you know, it took him years to, to realize that there's a Bengali. That's the first point. Second point, it's very fast, is that, is that you know, uh, you say that, that the Muslim thing in, in, uh, in Bengal was based on social economic issues, not on, on, on religion, on, 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 on religion. But if you look, if you compare this to, to the Punjab, it was an entirely, entirely uh, different scenario over there. Because in, in uh, Bengal, in the, the Hindus and the Muslim, and, 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 and yeah. Well, but in Punjab, the, the Unionist, it was under the rule of the Unionist party, where the Muslims were the Zaminda. And the reason why the uh, Unionist party agreed to actually join the Pakistan movement was again, the religion was not not religion, but it was because Congress wanted to abolish the Zamindari system, but Jinnah said, don't worry, I'll keep the Zamindari system. So how do you actually explain this uh, this uh, uh, divergence in the uh, Punjab and, and Bengal? Thank you. Last comment, Philip. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have the um, impression that most of your kind of your framework, your references are focused towards the uh, Bengal and I been rather looking at partition from the Pakistan perspective, and if I believe a lot of the Pakistani progressives, um, then I would perceive also in their view the partition as something that is rather imposed from a North Indian maybe around Aligarh. So um, I think, and I think that was not really teased out here what the discourses were centered around Aligarh and that group, and and because I think the elites even in in what is nowadays West Pakistan or Pakistan were not necessarily uh, very much in favor of this. So they also like now there's this very strong idea uh, that partition was inevitable because it justifies Pakistan because the Hindus wouldn't let us live this kind of narrative. But that was later on implanted. So, but originally, if you look at the Unionist Party in Punjab, for example, in 1946, you mentioned that in passing, but I think I would like to. To highlight a little more on this actually North Indian nexus that kind of came to implant this idea or came to how this came about this um, desire for Pakistan and decision also. So, last remarks by Professor Rashid. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, Professor Sayyid Wakir Ali Shah from Northwest Frontier Province of Pakistan. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. As you know, Northwest Frontier Province was pro Congress, both in 1937 and 1946 elections. And uh, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, known as Frontier Gandhi, he was in Congress. And Muslim League was defeated even in 1946 when there was the election was seen as a referendum on the issue of Pakistan. But as you mentioned, that the frontier province leader leaders they did not like compulsory grouping. But cabinet mission was torpedoed not because of North Frontier Province, meaning the leadership they did not like it, they were opposed to it. So mission uh, 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 was unsuccessful. It was torpedoed by the statement made by Nehru. Kazi, for that reason, the, the, your argument or point, uh, uh, yes, I know. That's why I said, 
And why did I focus on Bengal? That gentleman uh, raised this question. Because I made the statement that there would have been no Pakistan without the support of the Bengali Muslims, without the involvement of the Bengali Muslims. And I, uh, I thank uh, Sayyidda Ali Shah for his questions that in Northwest Frontier Province, Muslims did not have uh, that kind of support. Then in Punjab, you also mentioned Punjab. In Punjab, in the year 1937 election, only two seats out of 84. So it was very weak in uh, uh, Punjab as well, Muslim League. In Sindh, again, Muslim League could not field any, uh, nominate any uh, uh, candidates. Even uh, in, uh, after 1946 election, Muslim League initially could not form government there. Then why my focus is on Bengal? Because Bengal, I mean, one third of in, in the total Muslim population of India, they lived in Bengal. They came from Bengal. This is the huge concentration of Muslim population, right? And yes, there, there is fundamental difference uh, in the perception of Bengali Muslims and non-Bengali Muslims. That is the Muslim from Western zone, present Pakistan.